And I get lectures from you young people. Or so I don't want to smoke in the general room. I just needed a puff. Now I will put it out. <laughs> well, we don't judge over here. This is. <laughs> are you kidding? Young people are the most judgmental people <laughs> on the planet. And don't you see all that OK boomer stuff okay. <laughs> forever? <laughs> I'm like, this boomer will kick your ass. <laughs> Yeah, okay. well, I, I think well, folks I need to uh, work with their elders a bit more. So uh -huh. I think a lot of young folks need to work with their elders a lot more than they do. or deflecting everything. So they need to talk to their grandmothers and their aunties and whatever a lot more often. In fact, I used to assign my students to go do interviews with as if they didn't know their mother or their aunt or their grandmother. Mm -hmm. And they would come back and say, I had no idea. My grandma worked in a parachute factory in World War II mm. because they only think of them as grandma or mom or whatever, but not as a full person. The same way, if I'm going to respect young people and talk to them and listen to their opinions and find out where they're coming from, they should turn around and do the same thing for us, I think. Definitely. Definitely. So I'm going to let everybody in right now. So let's get started. We're about to broadcast. Now the broadcast is open to all the attendees. So this is going to be great. Now look at all them flooding in. Oh, this is so exciting. Do you see them, Miss Denise, at the bottom? No. I think I have to open up the chat thing. No. Do you see where it says participants? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. This is so great. I'm excited. Oh. Okay, let me see. I'm going to send this all out to everybody. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm about to, I was about to send this to you, Dante, <laughs> when it was supposed to be to the panelists. Great, this is so great. I'm gonna give it like a couple more minutes until more people start flooding in. I'm back. Oh, hi, Miss Erica. Okay, great. <laughs> Did it work? Uh, before I got back down there, it worked in another way. Okay. As, as it, you know, sometimes synchronicity is really uh, hilarious <laughs> that these two very important things, and I didn't find out until yesterday, and I just made an assumption that some people have two, three computers. Why can't they be on two, three different Zooms at the same time? <laughs> but it's all about how you signed up for Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, anyway. Great. We, did something. we figured it out. I'm glad. I'm so glad. Well, let's, if, if everyone's okay, we can get started um, now that everyone's here. Um, we're live on YouTube, so I just want to let you know that, Miss Erica. Um, but hello, hello, everyone. And there's, there's also, before we get started, there's people filling up with the participants um, at the lower end. So you can see that too. People from New York, DC, all over. So thank you all for joining in. Uh, my name is Jamie Swift. I am the executive director of Black Women Radicals. My pronouns are she, her. And Black Women Radicals is a Black feminist advocacy organization, and we're dedicated to uplifting Black women and gender nonconforming and non-binary people's radical activism in Africa and African diaspora. I am really super excited for this event today. I'm like been nervous all day. I couldn't sleep. Um, <laughs> I have not slept Aww. all day. <laughs> because yeah. I am so excited to be, just to see and to speak with Miss Erica and Miss Denise. Um, this event is in collaboration uh, with the Claudia Jones School for Political Education. And let me say their full names, as I call them Miss Erica, Miss Denise. We have the pleasure of having uh, Miss Denise Oliver Velez and Miss Erica Huggins here with us today. Um, and it's a privilege and an honor to be 
chatting with them and to gain insight about their work, their leadership, their activism, and their wisdom. As everyone knows, this month is Black August, where we reflect on radical Black social movements and movement building around the world. And this event is in partner, partnership with the Claudia Jones School for Political Education, but it is also one of our events for Black August on Black feminist political education. So in order for us to recognize where we are now and where we need to go, um, we are promoting the idea of Sankofa with this conversation that it's not too, it's not taboo to fetch what is at risk of, of being left behind, that we have to go back and honor our elders, honor those who paved the way for us so that we can know what to do and move forward. So before I kick it off to Dante to introduce himself and explain a little bit about the Claudia Jones School for Political Education, I wanna make something clear. This is a safe space, meaning we do not accept any transphobia, homophobia, queerphobia, racism, sexism, misogynoir. We don't accept any of it. And then unfortunately, if you can't abide by that, recognizing that this is a safe space, I will have to kick you out. So we're just acknowledging that. So Dante, I'm gonna kick this off over to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. And I will uh, second what you said. I'm extremely excited um, for this event tonight and I appreciate your you extending the invitation to us at the Claudia Jones School uh, for Political Education. Um, so uh, my name is Dante O'Hara. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, my background's in physics, so I'm a scientist. Um, and I'm an organizer with the Claudia Jones School, which is a relatively new organization. Um, so the Claudia Jones School for Political Education is a grassroots educational organization committed to enriching the political perspectives of the Washington DC metropolitan community. Um, we are named after black woman radical Claudia Jones, who was a member of the US Communist Party organi organizing around issues of black women's oppression and was later deported by the US government to London uh, where she spent the rest of her life organizing the Notting Hill Carnival and the West Indian Gazette. Uh, the Claudia Jones School creates opportunities uh, for the community to explore issues of oppression and exploitation by engaging workers and intellectuals from labor unions, organizations fighting racism and police repression, progressive cultural organizations and academia. It is consistently on the side of those who must work for money rather than those whose money works for them. It is committed to exposing the untenability of the contradictions of an advanced capitalist country where nearly 50 million of its inhabitants suffer from hunger and poverty. The school is a place for ideas to develop and turn into movements against exploitation, racism, sexism, xenophobia, and discrimination. And thank you, Jamie, for having us today. I really, um, I really appreciate it. This is so great. And we've partnered with the Claudia Jones School for Political Education before, and so we're happy to do it again. So before we introduce our esteemed guests and read their amazing bios, we are having an amazing cultural performance. And we would like to introduce um, those who are leading the cultural performance. So let me start reading about the amazing work that they do. So first and foremost, we have performance, performers from the Claudia Jones School for Political Education. So first off, we have Deborah Johnson, who is a native Washingtonian. She's a mother, spiritualist, progressive, writer, activist, and comedian. With her fiance's Gato Martinez Bentley support, she has embraced her creative writing skills, parlaying them into being a co-writer, co-producer, and co-director of the play, Half Our Story Has Never Been Told, The Awakening, which, which debuted at the Anacostia Playhouse in Washington, D.C. in 20, June 2019. She co-wrote a spoken word piece for an event for a Claudia Jones School event with guest speaker Dr. Gerald Horn in July 2020. All right, and I'll introduce the next uh, performer uh, that was already mentioned, uh, Gato Martinez Bentley, who's a native Washingtonian uh, revolutionary socialist. He's a father of two daughters and two granddaughters who he's taught the importance of the history of black people and the working class masses. He's a Nubian, Nubian warrior, Olmec spirit. Uh, his accomplishments are being a teacher for more than 39 years, a conductor, a contract negotiator, and an organizer, and founder of a child care workers union called Rosemount Child Care Center, and returns to Salt of the Earth Productions. He's a teacher, playwright, producer, director, actor, and social activist, and a griot, 
which is a storyteller who maintains a tradition of oral history in regards to West Africa and Southeast uh, Washington, D.C., or the South Side. He co-wrote a spoken word piece with Deborah Johnson for the Claudia Jones School event with guest speaker Dr. Gerald Horn in uh, July 2020. And last but not least, we have C.J. Allen, who is a thespian by nature. He's a Washingtonian who toured uh, the D.C. region with Sun Ra, a, the a theatrical performance ensemble. Mm -hmm. So we're super excited to have Deborah Gatto and C.J. Allen perform. So let's get to that performance. Hold up. Okay. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Is that a good angle? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Good to go. All right. All right. Thank you. 
so much for that uh, beautiful whoop, for that beautiful musical performance uh, Deborah CJ and Gato um, we appreciate y'all and uh, apologies for those on the call um, for some technical difficulties um, but I hope for folks that are calling in uh, they enjoyed the performance um, all right so now um, I have the honor of introducing uh, Miss Erica Huggins um, to begin, and then I'll pass the floor to Jamie to uh, introduce our other guest. All right. So sorry, I'm a little nervous because you know, um, actually, Erica, I, 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 Miss Erica, I saw you at an event in Oakland last year with uh, Alicia Garza um, uh, uh, and others as well, and I believe it was Huey Newton's um, uh, wife or. She doesn't like to be called widow, so I don't want to have that wrong. But it was at an event at Grand Lake Theater, which I saw y'all last year, and it was beautiful. And uh, so, yeah, I just want to say I'm, I'm a little nervous, but I, I, I'm so glad I'm in the space. And thank you, Jamie, so much for inviting me. All right, so Erica Huggins is a human rights activist, uh, poet, educator, Black Panther Party leader, and former political prisoner. For the past 36 years, she has lectured throughout the United States and internationally. During her 14 year tenure as a leading member of the Black Panther Party, Huggins was the director of the Oakland Community School 
the groundbreaking community-run child development center and elementary school founded by the Black Panther Party from 1973 till 1981. Sorry about that, y'all. When this is finished. In, in May 1969, Huggins and Bobby Seale were targeted and arrested on conspiracy charges, sparking free Bobby, free Erica rallies across the country. While awaiting trial for two years before charges were dropped, including time in solitary confinement, she taught herself to meditate as a means to survive incarceration and separation from her baby daughter. From that time, she's incorporated spiritual practice into her community work as a speaker and facilitator teaching as a, as a tool for change, not only for herself, but for people, no matter their age, race, gender, sexuality, or culture. In 1990, at the height of public awareness of HIV and AIDS, Huggins was the first woman practical support volunteer coordinator at the world-renowned Shanti Project. She also developed a unique volunteer support program for women and children of color living with HIV in the Tenderloin and Mission Districts of San Francisco. During her time at the Shanti Project and later the AIDS Project of Contra Costa County, she helped develop citywide programs for the support of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth and adults with HIV AIDS. She has served as a professor at San Francisco State University and California State University East Bay and Peralta Community College District. Huggins is currently one of the facilitators of World Trust. And I am there. And I give the floor back to, to Jamie. So I have the honor of introducing um, Ms. Denise Oliver Velez. Denise Oliver Velez is a political activist, feminist, journalist, community organizer, and anthropologist. She was involved in the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and AIDS activism movement, and was a member of both the Young Lords Party and the Black Panther Party. Oliver Velez was the former Minister of Economic Development of the Young Lords Party and became the highest ranking woman in the party. She and others challenged the ideal of revolutionary machismo and the Young Lords 13 point program, which led to the revision of the program with the, with the new point being, we want equality for women, down with machismo and male chauvinism. As a Black Panther Party member, she worked on the local Panther Party paper and did extensive international travel and solidarity work. Later, Oliver Velez established herself as a pioneer in media where she became the executive director of the Black Filmmaker Foundation. She was also co-founder and program director of Pacifica's first minority controlled radio station, WPFW FM in Washington, DC. She's public, published ethnographic research on HIV AIDS and co-wrote with Iris Morales, The Forward to the Young Lords of Breeder, edited by Daryl and Ekwanzer. In Iya Lorisha Ye Maya, Oliver Velez was also an adjunct professor of anthropology and women's studies at SUNY New Paltz. She's currently a contributing editor for the Daily Coast. So thank you so much to both of our panelists and we welcome you um, with warm arms. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you. And thank you, Dante. <laughs> thank you. Yes, so we're just gonna hop into it. So the first topic of discussion is on radical friendships, uh, sisters uh, and the struggle. So during my interviews with both of you um, for Black and Radicals, both of you spoke like so like highly of one another, like Erica's my girl, Denise is my girl, all these, these great things. So do you mind sharing with me or with the audience how you became acquainted with one another and any fond memories that you have while organizing um, with one another? And lastly, why is it important to create friendships and bonds while doing uh, movement building and political work? You go first. <laughs> well, I, we don't really know when we met first, but we know when we were reunited and that was long after the Young Lords and the Black Panther Party. And quite a lot of our life, right, Denise, was not anything to laugh at. No. It was, it was um, 
It was difficult. Our lives were always on the line. And though I knew about Denise, I'm not, I cannot remember where I met her, but I do know that I met her wonderful reputation before I met her in person. And we reconnected with various events over the years. The main one I remember was um, uh, Universe's um, uh, a, a performance company, uh, a couple uh, partners, the woman is um, Puerto Rican and the man is African-American. And they invited both Denise and I to become a part of their performance that, which was going to be held in um, Ashland, or Oregon at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival of all places, right? Um, party people. And it was all about the Young Lords Party and the Black Panther Party told through the eyes of current generation of young activists who were family members of people in both the party and the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords Party. And so not only did Denise and I show up for these, um, I wanna say the performances of the play, that was the easy work. We helped the actors and actresses and the coordinators behind the scenes to understand because this was Ashland, Oregon. They've never seen anything like this before. So, and it's, it's a very homogenous community, very beautiful. So we helped the, uh, the people putting on the play as well as our friends in universes to understand the complex multi-layered existence and conception of, conception and then existence of the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords Party and the lives of the people in it. And so with a background bond like that, I felt when I saw Denise in Ashland that I'd known her forever, that no time had passed and that everything we talked about, we could finish each other's sentences. And our stories were the things that we could laugh about now, many of them, um, because we were creative. We were imaginative. We were fearless. I'm not saying that we aren't still that way. I'm saying we were remembering back to Denise, I don't know when you joined the Young Lords, but I was 18 when I joined the Black Panther Party. And we lived full lives before we were into our 20s. That was old to us. And um, so to be able to see someone still alive, still offering herself to the people, as we used to say, serve the people, body and soul. It just did my heart good. And um, and we were also talk, able to talk about the things that had made us sad as women in both of these male dominant organizations. Mm -hmm. as, as people who, you know, intended to love people just as they are. And then sometimes we weren't. So um, I'll stop there. And the importance of friendship it is the most supremely important thing in our striving to serve humanity. We call it activism, but if our hearts are not open, if we are not generous of spirit, it will not work. You cannot lead, and friends know this, friends who've been through war know this, you can't lead with anger, you have to lead with love. And so Denise is just full of love. And um, one of the things we're gonna talk about in the way of friendship uh, today, and hopefully we'll get some time to talk about it, is how do we take care of ourselves? How do we really take care of ourselves? Not the, not the mainstream American 
spa day, but radical self-care. So I'll stop there. I think that what you have to say is so key for me. It was like um, connecting with someone that was in the same stream and we may have walked different paths, but they were parallel paths. And what was, was so important for me was to meet somebody who understood from a heart level and a gut level um, and did not find it strange or odd that, well, you're a panther, why are you talking about spirituality? You are young lords and the revolution, blah, blah, and whatever. And completely and totally having no concept of what our lives were like mm -hmm. and the unbelievable stressors. Um, I think nowadays people join an organization and maybe they go to a protest for one day of the week and then they take care of their lives or they go to work or whatever and they have very little understanding of what it was like to be in that 25 hours a day. And I'm not exaggerating. It isn't 24, it's 25. And from the moment you open your eyes, if you got any sleep, you know, day in, day out, no time off, you're removed from your family, you're removed from working at a regular job because your job is the revolution. And to be very honest with you, if you are a sister, it was more like 48 hours in a day because the women in the party did all the damn work. Absolutely. So Absolutely. to meet with Erica in this sort of idyllic place in Oregon at a Shakespeare festival and for her and for me, I think to know exactly what you're talking about without even sometimes having to say the words and to understand that there's nothing funny about the whole idea of us having to heal because I've always said that a lot of us suffer from post-traumatic revolutionary disorder, you know, and we work through those in sometimes in very destructive ways. And what it's all about at this point is, is how to change that. But also, I think both of us will say that we look at young people and we need to say a word of caution. You know, y'all need to figure out ways. Don't do what some of us did, which was go off the deep end with drugs, with alcohol, with whatever, all kinds of stuff because of that disorder you need to start taking care of yourselves now. And there's nothing that, that's revolutionary to take care of oneself, I it, believe. It certainly is. Well, thank you for both sharing that. Um, and that I just want to re reiterate that, Miss um, Denise, you said earlier that people kind of make you like this romanticized revolutionary person and that what, you live through and what you did was not a game. It, it's, it's, it, no one should take it lightly. And that people like went through hell and back and, and even didn't, you know, make it. And that this is a, this, this is a real life. Like when you dedicate your life, you dedicate your life. And I think sometimes we may read from Asada and all these other texts and, and in our interviews, we get so excited, but self care is so important because you've, definitely lived through a lot of things. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and Dante, if you want to take the second question, that'd be great. Yeah, so this next question is on uh, past, present, and future of movement building. So the question is, around the world, we have seen COVID-19 ravage our communities, as well as the pervasiveness of state violence against Black and other marginalized people. How have you been processing everything during these times? Can you connect this political moment to the times when you were organizing with the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords Party? 
And what advice and wisdom would you give to protesters during this time? Do you want to start, Denise? I can connect it to um, during the time that that I was in the Young Lords, a lot of what we were dealing with were health issues, things that had an impact on our community. And um, we didn't set out to say, okay, now we're gonna sit down and we're just going to deal with health. But how it turned out, we didn't have words like environmental justice back then, but we saw, we identified things that were wrong um, and we listened to people identifying what they felt was wrong rather than coming in with a Marxist textbook and imposing stuff on people. That's, you know, right. that's, that's an academic methodology. You gotta learn how to listen to folks. And sometimes what they're saying is wrong isn't what you decided that they should be doing. But I think that faced with COVID now, I can only relate it to how I felt when we had an epidemic of heroin running through our community and people like uh, Michael Tabor said the way over capitalism plus dope equals genocide, you know, and you could see that. Then later it was a uh, crack epidemic that swept through our community and um, we had tuberculosis. We had, I mean, the, the level of problems that were just health related. Yes, COVID is more extreme because we can see the number, the death toll racking up. But if you really want to talk about a death, think about the death toll over generations, over generations of black and brown people who have died because they haven't had the health care, they haven't had the treatment. They don't get mental health care. They don't get, they attempt to have spiritual health care in, in many different ways, but this society kills us. And so um, I was stunned when hooking up with Erica again, we had gone through the same stream of dealing with the AIDS epidemic in our community. And for a long period of time, the uh, treatment and the clinical studies that were being done were being done for white gay men. They were not addressing HIV AIDS in our community. They were not addressing intravenous transmission. They were not looking at the fact that women got the virus. They were excluded from clinical trials. So the same way we're seeing disparate impact with COVID in communities of color, we saw those same kinds of things with the AIDS epidemic. So it's not a new situation. Um, it, no. it is an ongoing situation from my perspective. And, and I agree with everything you said. And, um, you know, there are so many things I wanna say, first of all, Dante, um, I want you to know, um, because I think that you were able to invite the wonderful musicians who performed for us earlier. I grew up in, in Southeast Washington. And I, you know, I remember, this is why I went to the March on Washington in 1963 at age 15, because of those same conditions, Denise, then. And there is a way in which, even though we know that it's not historically true, we buy into the, the um, let's call it narrative of all of us waking up to something different during COVID. I think what, what's happening is that there are multiple viruses that we're waking up to. And one of them is the, coronavirus and the other one is the virus. It's also a mental and social illness. Mm -hmm. It's racism and it takes place structurally. So um, it's important for us to know for our very own selves how it shows up in us, even as people of color. I wanna say, not even as, especially as people of color, how, how colonization 
and caste show up in our communities and still are there. So we, you know, the knee on the neck of George Floyd and the horrific murder of Breonna Taylor and all of the people dating all the way back to Denzel Dowell, who was young African-American man killed and his story was the first story in the 1966 first issue of the Black Panther Party newspaper. So none of this is new and it goes, we have to take it back, Sankofa. We have to reach back and look at how plantation ideology is right here today. And that's what I was about to say about Washington DC. That's why I knew I had to leave and become part of something bigger because it was, if you grow up in DC, you go to high school, maybe if you had an advocate of some kind in your family or in your school, you might go to college. Um, but then the destiny for most young black people was to get a government job and move up the numbered hierarchy of those government jobs, which determine your paycheck. And I looked at it right around that time I went to the March on Washington, I was like, uh-uh, this is not my life. I don't know how I knew it wasn't my life. I just knew it in every fiber of my being. And at the March on Washington, I saw people gather in the thousands. I'd never seen anything like it. I'd never felt anything like it. I still haven't seen or felt anything like it to this day because people came from everywhere. And there are people from everywhere. I looked in the chat for this um, event. There are people from all over the country. There's somebody here from Montreal. Um, that's kind of how it was that day, except that people came reverent. They came dressed however they'd come from farms and from government housing and from churches, wherever they came from reverent because they knew that there were some people putting their lives at the time we called it the civil rights movement. Let me pause for a second. There is no such thing as calling something a movement that happened here. And then this movement happened there. That is how Western historians mm -hmm. destroy organic timelines. One melded into the other because it was the natural order of things. So when I stood there that day at, at age 15, I knew that there was medical discrimination because I watched it in my own family. My mother grew up in North Carolina where her mother never had a doctor come take care of her that she was living and dying with cancer because the black doctors didn't have transportation to get to her little rural city and the white doctors would not touch her. And so you see my mother lived through or was born during the 1918 pandemic, viral pandemic. So we must, must, must look at history and look at all of it. It's painful to look at it, but it did occur. And the reason why we have to look at it is it will help us to know what steps to take today. I think I, I'm thankful for the people who are white that are waking up during this time because they're slowed down and there was no way I'm sorry to put it like this, but there was no way to look at George Floyd's murder and make an excuse for it. That had been done every time before. Even people of color would do it. You know, he shouldn't have been, you know, he could have. Well, why didn't she say, I met the parents of 25 of the, of the young people whose names we say, 25 young people who died, some of them in front of their parents due to a mental health episode. We don't talk about that enough either. Um, and they talked about how they're able to live on. And it is because of young activists who understand that no mother no father should 
lose their child. And the healing is there too, isn't it? We are sitting with such cumulative trauma and we don't like to talk about it because, you know, sometimes people think that means there's something wrong with us. No, we're human beings fully, 100%. And so I just wanted to say that from my childhood, my teenage, and then joining the Black Panther, driving across the country, that was an education, to join the Black Panther Party in 1967, um, that was an education for me. I'd never seen the United States from a car window, from stopping at a gas station, but that was where I first saw the horrific treatment of brown people, both indigenous and those who were of Mexican descent. There's so much I could say, and it's all connected is how I want to leave it right here, Dante. It's, there is a nothing that is not connected. There's no one not connected to another. Our lives are all of consequence. So when we talk about anti-Blackness, we don't do so in a silo. As we used to say, the hierarchy of oppression we do so because we want to point it out and we want to end it. But we also know with all those babies still held at the border, some of them orphans, I think about them every day, that's anti-Brown racism. That's all you can call it. And so we have to be about all the people and work on the pieces of it um, really carefully, thoughtfully, and with compassion. One is not instead of the other. So sorry to talk a long time, but there are so many things your question brought up for me. And, oh, I almost forgot one thing. I will never, ever, ever forget. You mentioned Alicia Garza. Uh, what a lovely human being. And Patrice Cullors and Opal Tometi. Melina Abdullah is one of the Black Lives Matter people here in California where I live. Um, but I, I had a conversation similar to this one with Denise, with Alicia, and her experiences of organizing were as cumulative, cumulatively stressful as mine in the Black Panther Party. Why? Because of structural oppressions, because of structural racism. The FBI had something called counterintelligence program we have Homeland Security. Whatever you name it, um, it takes a lot of courage to step forward and say, I know that this is dangerous to speak the truth, but I will speak it anyway. And so I just wanted to give a shout out to Alicia. Thank you so much for both of you sharing. Um, it's really, insightful and invaluable, um, valuable. And I remember speaking with both of you and both of you reiterated the same thing that history is not in these, or, or not in these silos. Um, and that, um, and I had a break out of it when I was talking to you because it was like, oh, you're here, you're here, you're here, then you went here. And then when Miss Denise said, oh, when I left the Young Lords, I went down the street to the Black Panther Party <laughs> office and it was right there. And so um, I, I appreciate you both reiterating that because we do need to break out that of those silos um it's the it's the um it's based in and and sometimes we're not aware of this the academy teaches us that in order to study things it has to be in history, for instance has to be in in decade sec segments mm -hmm. yes that's okay yeah if i'm writing a paper or a dissertation or something, but we can't live like that. You know, we can't live like that because nothing in nature is is in silo formation. And it's not just in a time thing because it's the boxes that we put people in. Oh my and, God. I mean, I get attacked or questioned all the time. Like, what do you mean you're not a Puerto Rican? 
but you were in the Young Lords. And I'm like, and, you know, and Jamal Josephs was in the Black Panther Party and he's Cuban. And mm -hmm. Francisco Torres and his brother, Gabriel, one was in the Lords, one was in the Panthers, you know. That's right. But, but wait a minute, your last name is now Velez. I'm saying, yeah, and, you know, what does that have to do with anything? My best friend growing up was Hilda Oliver and she was from Puerto Rico, you know, so whatever. And so it's like, um, so you get this, okay, now we're going to deal with black things and then we're going to deal with Latinx things because now it's Latinx because it's no longer politically correct to say Latinos and Latinas or whatever. The point is, is like, I'm like, um, but do you understand that there are black people in Puerto Rico and black people in Colombia and black people, the largest black population outside of Nigeria is Brazil, mm -hmm. you know, and people go to me, what are you talking about? You know, yeah. because they've got pictures of the girl from Ipanema in a thong <laughs> who's white, you know, in their head. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that for me, part of getting involved in African diasporic spirituality helped me make some of those connections to New Orleans, to Hudu, to Brazil, Candomblé, to Santeria in, in Cuba and in Puerto Rico to Voodoo in Haiti and, you know, and things. And that opened me up to becoming close to people who were coming up to the neighborhood I live in, in upstate New York, where they were coming to Buddhist spiritual retreats. And they were walking different paths because the stereotype is that all Black Americans are rooted in the Baptist church. And that could be true in terms of part of that stream, but it's not the whole story. And we don't tell that story often enough. Um, and people get into their heads the idea that being a radical political person, I'm a revolutionary, so therefore all that spiritual stuff, you know, it, that's old time. And I'm into honoring the ancestors and walking in the path of my ancestors. And they don't have to be my blood relatives because on my ancestor shrine, I have Fanny Lou Hamer. You know, she's a woman that had a major impact on my life and kind of turned me around for you. It was the March on Washington. For me, it was meeting Miss Fanny Lou. And, um, so there are, I'm trying to develop for myself, you know, and sometimes I make mistakes and I err and I don't know what I'm doing, you know, but I have faith that I can find a path and that I can work on, uh, I consider myself to be a bridge person because I've lived in multiple cultures and I have somewhat of an understanding of multiple cultures and maybe I can help some other folk get out of the tight box that that they've been locked into because that's part of systemic racism is structuring us into those rigid boxes yes. so um, I'm hoping you know to get beyond some of that and knowing the negatives as well because we have racism colorism and whatever within our own communities yes. um and in the young lords we were addressing you know bad hair good hair all this kind of stuff and marry somebody lighter so your kid will get whiter and all of that crap you know and and that's built in part of you know colonialism and i still read Fanon, you know and and look at how that worked, not just here, but in Algeria and around the world. And I think that I hope that young people today or younger people today are beginning to do some of that reading. But I was very distressed when I was teaching. I had a whole classroom full of students of color and I mentioned Nina Simone and not one kid in that class knew who Nina Simone was. So, um, you know, so I played them for women, which 
is a very, very powerful piece of work that talks about some of this built into a song. Um, and I would suggest that anybody in this room right now who hasn't heard of Four Women, go to YouTube and check it out. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's amazing. Poetry, it's deeply spiritual and it's very true. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Denise. Thanks for being who you are. Well, you're a, you're a poet and you're a mama of a poet. I yeah. Heard, I have heard your, your son's work. So yeah. that was something that was great uh, getting to, to meet him coming out to yes. Ar yeah. Argon, right? Argon. Yeah, yeah. That's, it was that's Argon. Right. I'm trying to picture the map. I know I was out there on the West Coast someplace. <laughs> I, 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 it, there's so many funny stories about being in Ashland, Oregon, where it seemed like as we would walk up and down the streets between the theater and the restaurants that we could go to between our work, because we were there for work, um, that we were sometimes the only African-American and um, Latinx people that people who lived in the city had ever seen. But they would greet us in such a sweet and warm way because it is, you know, the Shakespeare Festival City. So of course they were warm and welcoming, but it was kind of funny, you know, and one of the hilarious stories, and this has to do with our, this is how structural racism works. And it's a hilarious uh, um, story about how insidious it is. In the city of Ashland, when we were there, it was, was it 2011 or 12? 12, I think. Right. Um, so I came and went a lot because I live closer by. And uh, people from the Young Lords came as often as they could. And um, so I found out from the person who was supporting the cast, you know, and these were all, with the exception of one, these were all people of color. And a great many of them were African-American. And um, there was not one hair salon in the city, not one, that knew how to deal with big Puerto Rican hair or the braids and the, and the, and the press and comb and the perms of African-American women, not one. There was this one actress who said, well, I'm just, I guess I'm gonna have to shave my head ball and wear a wig. We were cracking up. And so we had, that was part of the work that had to be done. Do you understand? It's hilarious, but isn't it predictable that they would hire all these beautiful actors and actresses and not just to take care of the women's hair. There was no one who knew how to give somebody a haircut, mm -hmm. a man, a haircut. So Actually, the company had to participate in finding a stylist and they did. And she and I had some hilarious conversations as well about what they brought her there for and why. But you see, structural racism isn't so very academic. It shows up and expresses everywhere. In every place we work, it shows up in us as we have been talking about it shows up in all the institutions of society and the only way to change it is to advocate for that change. And I'm using the term advocate because not everybody, Dante, can be out in a protest. Some people are not able-bodied. Um, some people are. Some people are not frightened of rubber bullets and tear gas. Some people are. Um, but there is something that everybody can do. And I want to say right now, everybody can vote. No matter what barriers may have been put out there by the occupant of the White House, um, we can vote. And right now, that's extremely healthy thing to do. And I'm not talking about loving electoral politics, not at all. 
but we have seen absolute chaos and I don't use this term, but it comes to mind, evil. Denise, as you were talking about um, spirituality, I was remembering how being raised in the Baptist church in, in Capitol View Baptist Church in Southeast and how much I love the singing and the chanting. I never was much into the preacher because sometimes what the preacher would say wasn't as uplifting. I'll leave it like that. But the singing brought to me something that wasn't European, that wasn't American. The singing is oh. a vestige. And I go to I go to a few folks' churches. I have been to Pentecostal, very evangelical churches, and I watch people, you know, and I, I used, no, but I used to laugh. I said, well, you know, they think they're being possessed by Jesus, but as far as I'm concerned, it's the Orisha, you know, and um, no, because spirit That's possession so is very good. African. Absolutely, it's and I loved very it. Very African. And so then when I started to meditate every day when you introduced me you mentioned that dante um i recognize the african in that and you know we're taught to refute that which we think is for russia for white folks no it's not what's for crazy people no it's how you keep your inner battery charged mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, that I, you didn't ask this question, Jamie, but I just want to mention this before I forget. It is so important for women of color, particularly right now, black women to, to acknowledge joy. We're full of joy. And there are things that for the, for the last while, for, for many, younger people at least have sucked all the joy out of our hearts. And so what I say, and I'll say it here, is that if you're in it for the sprint, you know, you're gonna go to a protest and then you're gonna say, okay, great. And you go back to work, then you cannot sleep. When Denise was talking earlier, I went right back to those times I have those memories of sleeping only when I was in a car and happened to fall asleep. The 25 hour day thing is no joke. Mm -hmm. So the sprinter is in it, can, cannot sleep, cannot eat well, cannot take care of herself. But the person in it for the long haul has to do it. And I will never forget seeing pictures of Rosa Parks doing Hatha Yoga, Rosa Parks in meditation. I didn't know that until four years ago because we're so sometimes unkind to one another that these things have to leak out as if it isn't okay. But if we track that idea of spirituality back, we find religion and spirituality was inferred is the opiate of the masses in Marxism. So dear Mr. Karl Marx didn't have any understanding of what women's lived experience was or people of color. If you read it, you'd be surprised. You would just be surprised at the things that he didn't know, but how could he? He was a man of the 1800s. We live in the 21st century. Whatever keeps us sane and healthy is the most important thing we can do. And we need to share our tips and tools with one another. And we don't come from a continent that dismissed spirituality. So um, I just wanted to say that it's important for us to take care of ourselves every day. Mm -hmm. And so, Jamie, I'm sorry if I interrupted one question you were going to ask, but I was afraid I'd forget. No, I'm letting out chit chat. I'm just happy, like, 
hearing what, all that you have to say, taking notes. Um, people in the chat are excited, but I did want to talk about more in depth, both of you about spirituality and self-care because um, we see on Twitter or social media how people have taken Audrey Lord's kind of, you know, um, mandate for self-care and kind of like memified it or commodified it where I think Miss Denise, you said, oh, it's taking a bath um, or like, you know, doing that. And, and I really would like for you to discuss, um, both of you, how you came onto this journey of self-care and spirituality. And if you can recall a moment where it was like, I really need to take care of myself and what specific tips or tools do you have for um, uh, for um, younger organizers or organizers um, about how to take care of ourselves. Because a lot of us are going through a collective depression since um, state, what we see on TV with state violence, but also the state of the world and all, all sorts of things still. A, a couple of things. Um, I mean, you know that I blog and I log on and I look at the laundry list of, you know, the horrible orange maniac in the White House and the mean and the death and the COVID and the whatever. And at a certain point, I realized if, if that was the only thing I was writing, it was very unhealthy for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. I needed to do some things. So I do a regular post on Sunday mornings and I decided that I wasn't going to do my standard stuff that I was going to write and share music. So one of the things that um, works for me and always has is music um, because I, I feel like there's something very basic about even our heartbeat and the rhythm of our heart and our breathing that is related to the drum, it's related to other instruments as well. Um, and that we need to take time out to just sometimes, um, people think that there are many ways to meditate, I find, you know, and I have done very silent meditation. Gardening for me is a form of meditation digging in the dirt. And if you live in an apartment, get a little flower pot and put it on your, your whatever, because having living things around you, my grandmother used to sing to her flowers and they bloomed all the time, you know? So finding things that work like that um, are very key. So for me, it's grounded in, in music. And it has been mentally good for me, but I'm also looking at the response of people who come in and talk and they, they share their favorite song and they share an artist that maybe I have never heard of. Um, and that process is, is healing on both sides. Um, and that's real simple. You know, it, it's not like some deep stuff, you know, find some songs that um, soothe your inner being, you know, and then there are times you want some things that are very upbeat and you get up and you dance and dance is another form of meditation. And there are whole systems with dervishes and whatever that spin and turn and dance itself becomes a form of meditation. You know, don't be afraid to explore things that seem strange, you know. Mm -hmm. Open up your open up your head and let different kinds of things in. And I mean, you know, it's hard for me as somebody who's 73 because a lot of times you think that getting old means that you have to also be rigid and shut down. And um, I'm trying to be open to stuff. I'm always talking to young people, like, tell me, tell me what you're listening to. Tell me what you're doing, you know? And if I don't like it, you know, I'll say, no, I'll go back and listen to some more Nina Simone. But I'm trying not to be stuck on stupid and, and ossified and rigidified. But I've also met some very rigid young people who don't want to listen to anybody old, you know? 
I told I was saying before this thing started, if one more person says to me, okay, boomer, I'm gonna go upside your head. You know, <laughs> I'll be real Auntie D, you know, and talk. And okay, boomer. Take that. Never mind. I didn't say nothing. I'm gonna be quiet now. Oh my God, you're funny. And you're honest. Well, you're it's how I feel when I hear some of that shit. Oops, I did it again. Yes. Okay, let me stop. However, I, um, I will be dignified now. I think we talked about this, Denise, on the phone. How really it's seated in a in a, in a you know an intention of honoring you for all that you've done, and and you know there is such a wealth of understanding that you hold. And I've come to understand there's a wealth of history that I hold and the people that I know and love do hold as well. But it's not in any books that people can read in school. So what people are doing is they're doing their, um, their investigation of what is true by on their own because there really are very few up to high school, there are very few ways that you are going to be told. So they're cramming in college. And let me say that the academy, and we do know this, let's be honest, is does reproduce oppressive ideas. And the whole, for instance, the idea of a thesis or a dissertation is a European and male, part of a European and male paradigm, right? Having written one, I decided that's something I never want to do because it didn't bring me any joy to know that the front cover of my, you know, to that point, my life's work had to, had the have these this kind of margin and that the words needed to be spaced this many this many points between each other oh come on why and then when you ask why um i was old enough to go in and ask why not care but it's it's a struggle to just get through the academy and i don't know if you know this i work with university students and the depression and the suicidal ideation in PhD programs is real. real. And the disconnect. Uh, the, thing, the disconnect. The because it's drives me. You, yes, it's having you stay in your cerebral area and never drop into your heart, which is so unfair for human beings. And then not to mention the 300% effort you have to put forward if you are a person of color. Dante understands, he's really nodding his head. But the way that I came to spirituality was a little different. And that is um, that I was, so let me give you, I'm gonna give you a short form of the long story. So I joined the Black Panther Party with the person who became my husband, John Huggins, in, 19, in November of 1967. And then um, we were pregnant in 1968. And our daughter was three weeks old when the FBI, in collusion with campus police and informants and operatives, killed him in broad daylight on the UCLA campus at Campbell Hall with my dear friend, Bunchy Carter. They were 23, John was 23, and our apprentice Bunchy was 26, and I was 21. So in one breath, boom, I was a widow and a single mom. And then I traveled to New Haven, Connecticut, where John's family was, to be there for the funeral and to spend time with the family. It was a very, 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 um, tender time. But I was so grateful that I could bring the baby to them so they had a little tiny piece of John 
And then in a few weeks, Yale students, it, we're in New Haven, Yale students and members of the black community asked me to start a chapter of the Black Panther Party there. And I checked in to see if I could and would and I did. And then within two months, I was arrested for a conspiracy with the intent to commit murder. This is what happened in the 60s and 70s. They did not play around. They would make up a story and spend taxpayers money to have everybody believe that that story was true and place people in carceral sites. At least I was in one that people knew about. And um, as a result of that incarceration and um, incarceration with no bail, I, I could not see my daughter. Well, I could see her for one hour each Saturday. And I was sitting in the cell, I was in uh, isolation because of my political beliefs. By the way, conspire, conspire means to breathe together. Mm -hmm. That's what it literally means. But at any way, I'm sitting there and I go, I can't go out like this. I can't see anyone I love. I've just lost my dearest two friends, one of them, the love of my life. And I have this little baby and I can't be with her. What am I going to do? And I went to one of my lawyers who I knew practiced Hatha Yoga before he entered the courtroom. That's what he did. He did a headstand every time he entered any courtroom before he went in there. And this was a, a handsome and well-dressed Charles Gary, street fighter in the courtroom. And I said, Charlie, I can't go out like this. I don't mind being alone, but I no John, no baby. And when I see her on Saturdays, I don't wanna cry the whole way through the visit. That's not what I want. And I said, can, can you please get me a book on meditation? And he brought me a book on Hatha Yoga postures. And it also talked about meditation. It said simply, and after you do these stretches, because I couldn't take a walk, I couldn't go out. I couldn't be in the inmate pop, quote, inmate population. Do you follow me? The little book said, and when you finish stretching your body, sit still a while and breathe. And so I did. And I began to regain the, the, the sense of myself that I was quickly losing, that I wasn't just some incarcerated, not valuable person, that I was me. And not only that, I was lovable and still capable of loving, even though I couldn't be with the people that I love. And over time, quickly with my daughter, because I just made a promise I wasn't gonna cry when I went to the visit, but I was able to be there and not cry. Of course, when I walked away from that visit, I bawl my eyes out, but not with her. That's not what she could understand. So also I was able to face the courtroom and all the lies and all of the horrors that came with that trial. And I was also able to be a good friend to Bobby Seal, who I was on trial with, the co-founder of the Black Panther Party. But more important than anything, because of meditation, I could find freedom on the inside. Mm. And that has stayed with me. There is nothing that would make me want not to get up in the morning and sit still a while and breathe. So as Denise said, it doesn't have to look like this or look like that. No, it doesn't belong to any one group of people. Um, it's been commodified. I worked with a group of South Asian women who said that, you know, all of our yoga practices, all of the yogic practices have been commodified 
And there are Americans who are seeming to be more Indian than I am, and we crack up laughing, but it's the <laughs> truth. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what I did and what I do and how it has allowed me to honor almost everybody that steps in my way and not judge and particularly not young people because I, 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 I want to say this and then I'll shut up. I remain hopeful, Jamie and Dante, because of younger people. That's what happens for me each morning. Okay, I just heard about one more death. This is after George Floyd, Floyd come on. One more killing, one more death. Those babies are still sitting there with low jacks on the border, orphaned. But I am hopeful because of young people. Because they'll do what I did. Hopefully not suffer in that way. But they will step forward in courage and be brave in conversation. And that's important. And so I just wanted to say that. That's a great, all these questions are so great. Thank you both. And um, thank you to you, Miss Erica, and also Miss Denise for sharing your stories. Um, and we really need to uh, hear these. I mean, thank you for sharing. And I mean, and I understand that it can be difficult to share these stories. And, and, and I'm glad, grateful that you have the heart too, because sometimes when we tell our stories, it's, it, we relive them. Um, but I'm also grateful that you did share because some of us keep a, a, what we're going through bottled up inside and don't know how to articulate or don't know how to address how we're feeling. And we keep working and we keep adding layers on and we don't talk about these things. And so I, we're grateful for your wisdom. And um, I'll say something to you, Miss Denise. I remember I'm getting my PhD as well. And I remember you saying, if your grandmama can't understand what your dissertation is, then you failed. <laughs> So I just wanted to leave you <laughs> with that but, one. <laughs> but it made sense, didn't it? Did it make sense? <laughs> well, remember, the reason I said that, and it goes back to what Erica was talking about, about the academy and the artificial structure of it and the box that you get shoved in. And I was lucky because going to graduate school, I was already elderly. So I really didn't have to sort of ab absorb that. And I was obstreperous and, and arrogant and questioned them, them people up there talking all that garbage. And so I still remember the day I sat in a class and this person got up and said, the epistemological, nomothetic, enic, etic, dialogic deconstruction of the paradigm shift. Oh, and I'm God. sitting in the back of the room and I was like, and I said, what the fuck did you just say? You know, <laughs> I mean, it, it was, it was beyond ridiculous. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, and now I'm looking at what somebody's laughing over here in the chat channel, but, but the, the reality is I could remember what my dad said. And my dad had a PhD, you know, in English literature. And my dad said, if your grandmother cannot understand you, you have failed. And that's sort of where I, I try to keep myself there's so many things that can pull you off into these 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 roots that are that are are not healthy for us, and because it is what it is. Well, that's academia. Why does that have to be academia? Why do we have to take a European construct and put it on people who have a history? We have incredible poetry. We have incredible thought, ideology, um, and that's dismissed because it doesn't come through a European lens. If it isn't Marx or if it isn't Foucault, if it isn't this one or that one, you're laughing at me. <laughs> Hi, Jamie, I see you. But the problem is, is that we put all of these 
I remember in grade, the German ideology. We had to read Hegel and Kant and Auerbach and this one and that one, you know. And you tell me who you are reading from the African Academy. And I make you a bet, there's not one person on that list, you know, um, not even close, you know, not even Caribbean thinkers. Um, and so it, that kind of examination, part for me of spiritually changing is changing the way that my head has been structured to think in somebody else's boxes and trying to find other ways of thinking and being and moving and doing um, and searching. And, and it, I don't always find it. There are days that I'm not always peaceful. I have to say that because there are days that the pain leaks through and I have to consciously spend a little more time figuring out a way to do some cleansing of myself. And I also, um, and this may sound strange to you, <laughs> ways that we don't pick up other people's negativity, mm -hmm. you know, because people come at you with some negative stuff and you can be around them and they can bog you down with them, drag you down with them. And we have to learn ways to, to clean that off of us as well. And, and positive, I, I don't know, affirmations or whatever you want to say. I know people that sit down and they can give me a laundry list of everything that's wrong with them and everything that's bad and everything is, they beat themselves up with, with sticks. And I try to tell them, take a feather. They don't ever talk about the good things. You know, when do you sit down and say, I have a lovely smile, you know, or I have a wonderful laugh, or, you know, I walk beautifully, or I cook wonderfully. You know, how many times do we actually think of the good? And because we're taught always to list the negatives about ourselves. You know, it's terrible and whatever. Um, I mean, I used to, to whine and complain all the time about being skinny. You know, I've been skinny my whole life. And this was a defective character, you know, because as a black woman, not having hips and a butt and all of this kind of stuff, it was not acceptable. Because, no, and I felt bad about this. They used to call me olive oil. Denise is the pirate's treasure. She got a sunken chest and stuff you know we crewed each other young girls no serious and i had to spend a lot of time working on casting out those negative things that i have been taught about me that are very personal you know we don't when you're in a radical movement and whatever you're not supposed to have you know feelings of love romance broken heart you know um how you negotiate relationships and self-image and all that kind of stuff because people don't expect you because you're busy being out there making a revolution. You're not supposed to have any feelings, but we were young people then and we had partners and we had people that had children and we had people that hooked up in different kinds of relationships and we had to negotiate those things, but we also brought negative images uh, that had, we had been structured into that with us. And we didn't have the time at that time to sit down and have, you know, I don't know, group therapy sessions. We had criticism, self-criticism, where they told you all the shit you did that was fucked up and then go, go to study hall or get hit upside the head with something. Um, so the positive affirmations, we formed a women's caucus and we began to try to do some of that kind of healing work with each other. And we had been set up for the sisters to be confrontational with each other. Um, the brothers had set up a dynamic that it was a competition between sisters from different branches. And it was 
going to throw down to something physical. And finally, our sisters had to look at each other and say, wait a minute, no, no, uh-uh. Let's cut this right now. We are sisters and we are not going to be fighting over some man and whatever. They're not going to set us up. And we sat down with each other and began to work on the getting rid of what women are structured to do, which is be competitive with each other based on a lot of physical attributes, not mental ones usually. Um, and that was a real learning experience. I mean, we were, some of the sisters in the group were like 15 years old, you know, 15, 16, 17. I was elderly at 21 in the party, you know? And you're laughing, Erica, but am I telling the truth? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm living it with you, yes. Because, oh no, I was old, you know? And, um, and yet, you know, you're really a child in many ways. You have to grow up and take the burden of the struggle on your back and you're willing to die, you know, and some of us did and some of us didn't. And then those of us who didn't were left with the burden of all of the weight of the deaths on you, you know? And, and I wanna say something right here before I forget because there are still people, you know, Erica and I are out here and moving around and doing, you know, we have a life outside, we can walk out the door. There are still people from the party um, who are incarcerated. That's absolutely true. 50 years. Mm. Chip is 50 years, I think, is uh, Fitzgerald right now and other brothers. And people have just erased them. It's like they didn't exist. You can say, oh, it's great. You were in the Young Laura's. I like to talk to you, talk to her. You were in the party, you did this. But what about those people? And we talk about prison abolition and whatever, but we ain't dealing with people who are the prisoners. We have political prisoners to this day, the over and beyond, yes, the incarceration rates or whatever, but they have been abandoned, you know, and they were down, they were committed and they're paying the price and they don't exist. People who, we talk about Black Lives Mattering and we, we can call the names of martyrs, but you know something, they did. And there are people who are alive, rotting in prison. And I defy you to call their names. Yes, that's so true, Denise. Thank you for saying that. Um, are we gonna, um, Jamie, are we gonna have time to talk to people? Yes. Um, we, uh, before we go into that, I just want to say thank you for sharing that, Miss Denise and Miss Erica. Uh, we do need to honor and acknowledge those who are still incarcerated, who are martyrs, and, and unfortunately, their lives were taken because of the work. And I think about this in the context of Brazil when we talk about Marielle Franco, the Afro Brazilian bisexual um, politician, feminist who was assassinated. And, I was um, on a call um, with a group called Odara, which is a Black women's, I mean, I'm sorry, Quilomba Collective, which is the first Black Brazilian women's collective in the US. <coughs> and her sister was on the line and, and she was like, everyone's saying Marielle Presenti, Marielle is here, but she's like, she's not here. She, like she, there, she, she's not here. And it's very difficult for us. So I think and with this conversation, it, it's important to acknowledge that um, those who've, who've their lives were literally on the line and, and lives were taken. Um, and we, we are able to be here because of them and, and to acknowledge that. And also to acknowledge the great work that y'all have done, both of you, Miss Erica, Miss Denise, because we stand on your shoulders. Um, as a younger person, I do not take that light, lightly at all um, of the work that you've done um, and the work you continue to do. Because like I said, if it wasn't for we, we wouldn't be here today. And this is the purpose of the, the call. So I, I really, or the, the Zoom, and I really appreciate you both. Um, Thank you. Yes. Thank really. you. 
and and I want to mention two of those people. They're friends of mine, um, who who in the last few years uh, were released from Angola prison. That would be Albert Woodbox and um, Robert King. And one of them served. Not only did they serve time that long, uh, outrageous decades of time, but both of them entirely in solitary confinement. What human being dreams that idea up and then carries it out? But they both have books. And I'm going to mention the books now so that people can find them and read them. They both were in the Black Panther Party. Albert Woodfox's book is called simply Solitary. You should hear him talk about his life in confinement. It's just the most beautiful thing. And Robert's book is called The Bottom of the Heap. Both of them are, to, are separately and together when they speak together because they are friends. They're solitary. Thank you, Dr. Right. That's Albert Woodfox. When I heard him recently in San Francisco at a museum talking about his life and his book and Robert was with him, they travel together often. Um, I, having been incarcerated, it was another one of those moments where I tapped into that place that meditation takes me so that when I went up to say hello, I wasn't all sobbing and crying. He'd already explained, they both explained that they decided to do with that unbelievable length of time they spent absolutely alone. I'm letting that land for you. This is not lockdown in COVID-19. This is not lockdown. That's lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, they said that they decided each separately to become the men they always wanted to be. Mm. And in that crucible of solitary, let go of all kinds of things. Is that what we want for people? Can't we take a tip from Robert and from Albert and do it without having to be in solitary? We have this time of a pause, the long pause is what I call it. For some of us, some of us are still out there working and it's not Zoom, we're frontline, but still life is different, it's a different rhythm. And we can begin working on ourselves, even if all we think through is, why do we love silo formations? Why do we hear for instance, three times today, and I love everything about George Floyd and his family. So please don't misunderstand. What do we know about Breonna Taylor's life? Why don't we celebrate it out loud more often? Why can't we talk about her? Why can't we have Zooms about Brianna? I don't know the answer to that question. I know what it is. The answer to the question is for me, but I don't know it for anybody else. I'm just quizzical. I just ask a lot of questions and I'm asking it now. Where's the book on Brianna? I know there's one in the works or two or three or four of them, but Quite often, the only name we can say, only woman's name we can say is Sandra Bland. And we should. So say her names. And that's something that Robert and Alfred, Albert talk about when they speak. The, the attempt to abolish prisons for women should be at the top of the list because wait, we're socialized so that as my experience shows, women are the ones who are meant to be taking care of the children or 
their partners or husbands were arrested or killed first. So if then they go to prison, what happens to the child? It wasn't a pretty picture for my daughter. It was a what she was well cared for, but I'm saying, truth be told, she was without, she was without either of her parents. So uh, we don't, we're, we're, again, we're, we're socialized to believe that men are more important. We're not conscious of it all the time. And then we get angry about it. I'm not angry about it. It is a fact. It's the, it's this, it's the social structure we're raised in, but we can rethink it. We can imagine the world we really want, right, Dante? Where little girls are revered as well as little boys. So I just wanted to, to say that about Albert and Robert. I hope you're able to read something that they've written, um, even if you can't finish the book or don't have time. Um, and Eddie Conway is also out. And Eddie Conway spent 37 years in solitary confinement. It just, I'm telling you, it makes me wanna cry to remember that that's what they went through because I know what that means. It changes your very humanness at a cellular level to be separated from humans for so long. Thank you okay. both for sharing that. Um, and, and Dante, I'm about to take, give it over to you to do the Q&A. And when you were talking about uh, women's prisons, I just want to quickly say and uplift like Black trans women like Remy uh, Fells, who was uh, murdered in Philadelphia, and Nina Pop. And I think, um, and also a Black trans man, Tony McDade, and we and and uh, Corinne Gaines, who is uh, had a, a disability, and I, and there's like all these intersections that we need to really talk about when we talk about um, incarceration and our sisters and siblings and and, and in in the in those systems. And so, um, because it is like I, I I can I can't speak from experience, but I can only imagine. I, I don't want to imagine, you know. Uh, but we should we should really think about it and and honor those. Yes, give them survivors at different intersections. So yes, absolutely. And just so people can know that when you walk into a women's prisons, because I still go back to offer support. I'm a restorative justice practitioner, so um, I go into prisons for men and prisons for women, and also those juvenile prisons where the babies are, the 13 to 17 year olds. Anyway, what I wanna say is that in each, each place I go, and it doesn't matter where in the country I am, the rooms, the cells are filled with black and brown people. It's a given. So we have lots of work we could be doing. And even if all we did was write a letter to somebody, you know, Black Panther Party members all wrote to somebody. Yep. Did you do that too, Denise? Oh, yes, we did. I wrote to the San Quentin Six. I don't know so, if you know who they were. So, but so did I. That in Google and you can- Wait a minute. Them. So did I. Yes. We were writing to- we were writing to a lot of um, brothers and we were writing to women who were in Bedford Hills. Because, That's right. Um, and when, this is how, yes, when we did this, um, we would find out all kinds of abhorrent things that were going on. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize until we started dealing with the women's bail fund was set up. Um, a lot of guys get busted and somebody from their family, their mother, their girlfriend, their wife, their cousin, whatever comes and brings them stuff, gives them money for commissary and will get the bail up. A lot of times when women get arrested, they are persona non grata in their family. No one shows up for them. Uh, they get no visits. 
because of the way we view women as as deviant in society and what's acceptable for men. So there's a level of, I realized back then when they set up the Women's Bail Fund, I had no idea that there were women who were sitting in jail for a long period of time and nobody got up the $25 that had to be put up for their bail, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so, and that hasn't changed in terms of the way women in prison are viewed and the way men in prison are viewed. And again, that's that structural sexism too. So yeah. I agree that um, find somebody. We had a list of people we wrote to and you knew if you didn't get a letter back that maybe they were in the hole. They had been thrown in the bin so that they couldn't. And then you could call and question, you know, that you haven't heard from people. So, um, yeah, I think the Jericho Project website has a list of names and they have um, links to be able to write to people. But I don't have the web address, so maybe if... Um, if it goes into the chat, people could check that out too. And, and also, if you're doing prison abolition work, you can remember you're thinking of abolishing prisons. And as Denise said yesterday, remember that there are millions of people locked away inside right now. And it doesn't mean you have to not work to abolish prisons. Well, we should. They do not work. They do not work. However, we have to think about the people who are locked away and why so many of them look like us and were raised like many of us. And, and so many of them are brilliant and talented scholars and writers and artists and dancers and healers and would-be doctors and historians and elected officials, it's an absolute waste. And it begins at birth as the institutions of the society we live in are set. So we keep saying we're gonna to go to questions and answers, but then we keep on talking. <laughs> All right, uh, so I guess I'm leading this section. So um, first I wanna say thank you so much for your uh, beautiful words and I've been nodding my head over here in the background a lot I'm sure y'all been seeing <laughs> uh, yeah Miss Erica yeah, like yeah you talking about you know graduate students and the dissertation like I just finished my PhD last year and oh, we. Uh, yeah like that that was a struggle just writing that thing up and working at the same time and uh you know it's having no real no real guidance to like how to write this thing and then yeah I have to use late tech like a certain software to do a certain way to make it you know clean and you know and, and grad school was what mostly gr grounded me in my uh you know radicalization if you want to call it that because I was like one of the very few black students in my department when everyone else is white you know or, or uh mostly white men or Asian men um and you know there's this white paternalism that gets used towards me because like oh I'm gonna help you get to where you need to be like because you're this one black person in my department so yeah, so I'm nodding my head and then, you know, the issue uh, about, you know, mental health and suicides, like a lot of graduate students have these yeah, high expectations to be in this, you know, elite class. And then, you know, if they perform poorly, yeah. So and I, I don't want to get into like some things that I saw myself, but uh, we could talk offline if y'all want to talk more later. So, um, and, and Denise, thank you so much for your words too. Sorry if this comes out the wrong way, but you remind me a lot of my mother. Like she is extremely spiritual and uh, you know, does a lot of yoga and she thinks in a metaphysical type of type of way. And I guess I guess I'm more radical. So like, you know, I, I use like these radical terms and then she uses this metaphysical type thinking. And we, we also interconnect too, because it's like we have the same, we see the same enemy, you know, you know the capitalists, you know, um, the white supremacists, et cetera. So and then but we we ground it in certain different ways, but 
um, yeah, I just want to say that because a lot of things you said reminded me of my mother. So I just want to say that. Um, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> she must be a wonderful woman. Will you mm -hmm. tell her that hello? Yes, I wish she was on the call right now, but I'm going to forward her the recording after this. So. <laughs> yeah, but tell her that Denise and I, right, Denise? We send our love to her because you honored her by bringing her up in this, in this, in this setting. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. That's a spiritual practice right there, Dante, what you did. Your mama. That, we think of things in binaries. Either it's you're sitting off and meditating or you are a radical. No, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. And so take care of yourself. We're talking about radical self-care. Those words can go in a sentence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the ways in which boys and men are socialized to believe they're not supposed to show any feeling, they're not supposed to cry, they're not supposed to love, they're not supposed to be sensitive. Oh man, that triggers people, the sensitive man. What's wrong with showing the feminine aspect of ourselves? Well, in this, in this highly masculinist, um, society we live in, what's wrong with it is that it doesn't fit in that box. So I'm going to shut up. We're going to talk to people. And Aaron Washington, I know you're out there. I just want to say, hey, Denise, did you know Aaron is in the chat box? No. Yeah. I, where are you, Aaron? <laughs> she's okay. somewhere. I don't know. But she's been writing little things in the chat box. So anyway, all righty. All right, so, um, and I wanna say one more thing. Uh, yeah, I, I was in a talk with uh, Albert uh, Woodfox at the Berkeley uh, Book Festival last year too, where uh, he was in conversation with someone um, and I, I was thankful to shake his hand and got him to sign my book that I bought from him that day. So um, yeah, I'm so glad y'all brought his name up and uh, yeah, free all political prisoners, um, get involved with the work um, if you're not already. Um, so yeah, so we should jump into the, Q and A, because we only have, uh, you know, ten. Hi, Erin. There she is in the box. Yes. Yeah. So this first question is from, uh, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, Sare Yosef. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to build communities of trust for those of us who are writers? How can we broker relationships and amplify diverse and connected stories without parachuting? How do we ground our work and use our voices responsibly? By trusting and using our voices responsibly. By forming, we, we can circle up. It doesn't, you know, my mother was one of those people and my aunts, my mother was one of 11 children and they were from the Christian church. But another, another surviving African thing I noticed about them is if someone was sick or someone was dying, they'd sit in circle and pray. So why can't we have the trust of that kind of circle? We don't have to always pray, but can we hold each other? Can we befriend each other? And if somebody says something, I mean, black women are very critical of each other. Do you notice that, Jamie? Do you notice that? We're critical. And it's something about trying to let go of the shackles of the, the critical male gaze and the critical white gaze. And we don't know how to hold each other in gaze yet. <clears throat> so one thing I do that helps to develop trust between me and others, To I love the question this person asked. I saw it in the chat box and it really touched me. Thank you for asking this question. What I do is I tell Jamie how beautiful she is, how her shirt and her lipstick and her beautiful smile light up everybody who sees her. Mm -hmm. And I may not know whoever I'm talking to, they might be in the supermarket, although those days are not, they're numbered these days for me. What beautiful earrings you have on. 
what a lovely dress. Instead of holding the residuals of the male and white gaze and going, mm, she should never have put that shit on. Look what she got, look at her head. We can hold each other in circle, like in a writer circle. Um, there are poet circles. There are reader circles. We can read our work and we build it on our own. We build it with people who we've come to trust. We don't start by putting a call out on Facebook maybe. We, bu we build one at a time, first one woman, then another woman, then three or four. And we're not there to critique, we're there to listen and find the beauty in the crafting of work that some other human woman has done. And maybe we have to talk about refuting that male and white gaze. Maybe we have to talk about refuting that heterosexual gaze. All these phobias are made up. We bought into them and they've made us sick. We don't need them anymore. They make us sick. They make us unhealthy. So I never critique a fellow poet, never. I don't care what they're writing about. I don't care what they're talking about. They're letting something that's in their hearts and minds and bodies shine out of them. And that's good enough for me. And it's not because I don't want to be critiqued. I've learned it's not so helpful all the time. And then if somebody asks for help, that's different. Somebody asks for help. But I hope that answers in small part your question about trust. You know, when those ships left, let's say Ghana, when those ships left Ghana, do you know that they put tribes who did not like each other, who did not know each other, who had beef with each other, they combined them into the same ships? Think about what that did to us. Just think about that for a minute. That is true. That is so true. And then slavery highlighted, underscored, and developed this internalized racism so that we were we were taught only to trust that one who owned us that woman who owned us not just men mm -hmm. and not each other and we haven't healed from that awful trauma so I could talk on and on and on and on and on about it, but um, I won't. Um, we have to be motivated by love. And there's, there's enough love in every human heart to, to heal the planet. So um, I love that question and thank you so much for asking it. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Erica. Ms. Denise, did you want to add to that? No. <laughs> mm -mm. Yeah. Um, may, and then we only have three more minutes and we don't want to take up too much of your time, but um, I was, was wondering if you would all like to give any final words or, or anything, because um, I know there's so many people like they like this, this Q&A box just like blew up, um, but... <laughs> Can we take one more question? Sure, sure, sure. Um, let's see. Someone asked about, okay, someone, uh, I'm not saying, uh, forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong, but Yugochi Kemi asks, I don't hear much about empathy, empathy with an activist work. Do you think that empathy is needed? Would it be too much to be very empathetic with an activist movement? No, it's, it's crucial. It is life affirming right now. We have to be practicing empathy. A little girl, um, Yaguchi, a little girl 
in a classroom where I was um, talking about history one day said to me that she was in the kindergarten and we were having a very kindergarten conversation. And she said, I know, and I asked them if they knew the word empathy, that it was kind of like the word compassion. And I, asked, and I explained how it might look and this little girl said to me, she said, I'm only six and my brother's older than me, but sometimes my mother will leave us in the car together to go to the grocery store. This is a couple of years ago. And, um, and sometimes she leaves us a snack or a sandwich while she's shopping. And then I notice people who are on the street who are houseless. And she said it like that, not knowing that it was a turn. All she knew is that they didn't have a house. And she said, and then I think, I wish I was a big girl. So I, it must feel terrible not to have a sandwich. And I wanna get out of my mother's car and give the person I'm looking at half my <coughs> sandwich. Half my sandwich, she said, that's empathy. That you're willing to step into someone else's shoes and walk around a while rather than blaming them for their condition you take their life into your life in a particular kind of way. And it's not that you carry them around with you all the time, but you just train yourself to figure out what is happening here like that six-year-old did. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Ms. Denise, did you want to add to that? I remember that one of the first sort of radical slogans we had in the party, we would have political education classes and they would always quote Che, the, the revolutionary was guided by true feelings of love for the That's people. Right. And, you know, you have to remember that like Che was sort of this macho male figure, right? And a lot of the brothers at first and some of the women were like, this is talk about love, you know, because that wasn't like macho. And, and yet, if you don't have not only love for the people, but, but it also has to be love for yourself. Because if you cannot love yourself, you can't love anybody else, you know. So working on ways like Erica was saying about Jamie's smile, you know, or ways to find something positive and good uh, caring to say to somebody. And that doesn't mean letting people walk all over you either. No. People, people tend to then go to another extreme. Not everything is wonderful, flowers and happy and whatever, because there's some stuff that just sucks in life that you have to confront, you gotta deal with. So, um, but without empathy, and, and for me, I was taught in another kind of program, a 12-step program, that there was a difference between empathy and sympathy. And I always laugh because I had a sponsor that said to me, sympathy's in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> empathy is when, oh, well, that was what he said. And, and I would be like, and he said, he likened it to feeling better than someone and whatever, and being in a way sort of superior in your lifting up the downtrodden stuff, mm -hmm. as opposed to opening yourself up to feelings and having that empathy. So he made a distinction between the two. And I don't know whether that's valid or not. I know it's worked for me. I have tried to develop the cords of empathy there rather than feeling superior and handing out charity. And we were told never look down on somebody unless you've been in over to give them a hand up. That's it. 
So, um, and that is also combating elitism gets in the way of empathy too. And we have to be very careful that we don't mimic the systems of oppression that we're trapped in by doing exactly the same thing, but just within our sphere. That's um, right. We need to check ourselves on that. That's basically it. Well, what, oh, I, I'm like, I can't stop smiling. When you gave me the compliment, I get so embarrassed and crunchy, which is like uh, nervous and my cheeks are becoming red, but thank you so much. Um, I'm really grateful for this event. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much to both of you. Miss Denise, you are, when I wrote about you, like you're a rebel, you're a riot, you're all these things that um, bold, beautiful. I got big um, mouth. I love it, you know. <laughs> thank you. I love it so much. Um, Miss Erica, you are full of positivity and light and beautiful and, and just, I appreciate. I was I was nervous to talk to both of, both of you. I was like shaking when I first did the interviews, but y'all are so down to earth. I can't even get over it, and I <laughs> and I'm just so appreciative of this conversation. And to Dante, thank you so much for everything, um, for being a great comrade, and thank you for the work that you do at the Claudia Jones School for Political Education. And to Miss Deborah, uh, Mr. Gatto, and C.J. Allen, I appreciate you too. And to Dana, our wonderful captionist, I appreciate you so much. Um, you are, from our interact, brief interactions, you are so sweet, so thank you. Um, and to our audience members, you should see uh, the comments on Twitter. They were laughing at you, Miss Denise, or saying you would knock somebody out if someone else calls you a boomer. So I'll <laughs> send you that. <laughs> and so uh, to our audience members, thank you so much. And I just wanted to let you both have the final word. Um, before we close out. Make a list of your ancestors whose path you want to continue, that's all. And if you don't know the names of the ones in your family, then invent your own family tree. You can adopt all kinds of folk and throw it in there. And because that's part of that continuum rather than chopping up our history into these little nice packages and segments. So, you know, so I got a list of, like I said, one of my key ancestors is Fannie Lou Hamer. And I have others as well, but she always comes to my mind. I have a picture on my little smartphone when I turn it on, who pops up is Fannie Lou. I carry my Edwin shrine, that's my ancestor shrine with me on the phone, okay? Thank you, Miss Denise. There's so many things that I wish I could say to each person in person to, to, you know, not just to a little tile, but to a real face. And um, one of them is that one day, unless you are in, our generation, me and Denise, one day, Jamie and Dante and the people who asked all the questions, especially the questions that we, we acknowledged and tried our best to say a little bit about, someone will say, and I stand on Jamie's shoulders. Can you think of yourself that way? That you are someone who others can look up to. Someone, a friend of mine called it, think of a spiral of mentoring mm. that it keeps going. I love that, it's visual for me. Um, and so don't just look upward to those of you who've come, us who've come before you and don't just look at the babies who are coming, but think about what you're doing right now in the presence. That's part mm -hmm. of why we reach back to the past so that we can be absolutely present in all of ourselves in these moments that we're in. And also we can be stealthy about when we're in the academy, 
we can say, oh, that's what they, they're saying. They need from me, but never give up your beautiful, joyful, colorful secrets. Keep them with you, keep them close, put them in your all your pockets, keep them in your wallet, but mostly keep them in your heart. And remember that as Denise said, that Che Guevara said, this is my favorite quote of all time, Denise, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, a true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. Nobody threw him out the, Fidel didn't throw him out of anything for saying that. But he starts by saying at the risk of seeming ridiculous, he knew who he was talking to. So I'm quoting it because it feels right to me. And I wanna leave you with one other quote and I share it as often as I can. One of my favorite black American and lesbian poets, June Jordan, wrote a poem to South African women. And there's somebody in the chat box who met me in South Africa. Hello. June Jordan says, we are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the ones we have been waiting for. So thank you so much to everybody and maybe some point in life, we will connect again. Thank you all. Thank you so yeah. much, this is great. Be safe out there, beijos, kisses, and just thank you again. Thank Have you. Have a good one, everyone. Be safe out there. Don't knock anybody out now, Miss Denise. I'm gonna be watching you. Oh, she won't. <laughs> I weigh 99 pounds soaking wet, but, but I can talk a good game. I love it. I love it. Well, have a good night, everybody. Thank so <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.